Okay, I've got top of the hour. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning and good afternoon to all of you joining us today for our 20th installment of a virtual Thursday. So almost uh, almost half a year of doing virtual Thursday. So uh, they've, they've been a tremendous success. We're going to keep them going. Um, as you probably noticed, we're going to start uh, focusing more on process um, oriented virtual, uh, virtual, virtual Thursdays instead of just uh, overall modules. Um, so we can help people with specific tasks and needs with, um, within, the, within their department. Today's topic is on agency friends and data sharing. Uh, I know we covered this briefly um, a few uh, virtual Thursdays ago in the admin module, but we're going to focus um, exclusively on it today and show you some nuances with it and hope get, hopefully get you comfortable with this tool. Um, it is a very good tool, especially with um, mutual and automatic aid, as well as sharing um, inspection forms as templates. So we're going to go over that today. Uh, we've got Super Bowl weekend coming up. And uh, before we uh, talk uh, briefly about that, I did want to uh, mention uh, everybody that's joining us from the uh, from the south and uh, the east coast. Um, I hope you're staying warm. You know, some pretty rough weather there in uh, Alabama and in Georgia. Uh, I know I was there for some training in Anniston not too long ago, and it was beautiful despite it being the winter. I can't imagine uh, that, that uh, polar vortex dipping down that south to, to that area. So I hope everybody's been safe and you've been running calls and helping uh, helping people in need. So uh, hopefully we'll get some warmer weather here very soon. So I've uh, got one quick poll question we're going to start off with right away. Easy one. I just want to see what time zone we've got everybody joining us from today. You wouldn't mind taking a second to vote on this. Kind of want to see where we've got people uh, jumping in today. Okay, we'll close the poll in 10 seconds. 10. 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. We'll go ahead and close the poll. Last chance. Okay, pretty spread out. A lot of Pacific and Central. So we've got uh, 11 o'clock on the West Coast and 1 o'clock in the Central time. Very good. Okay, so we're all, everybody across the country today joining us. So thank you for being here today. And for all my friends in the Pacific Northwest, I just want to let you know how it's going to work out this weekend, which is going to be the winning team. All of my uh, coworkers up in the Bellingham office you know, are rooting for... For Seattle, they're part of the 12th man out there, but I think we all know Manning's going to, he's going to pull it off this, this week. So for all you Broncos fans, let's hope for a great game. All right, that's me. I'm Tom Lewis, lead trainer with uh, Emergency Reporting. There's a little bit of my background. I've been uh, with the system since 2004, seen it change dramatically. And in fact, today I've got some pretty interesting things to show you on uh, some of the most recent changes and they're both results of our regional training cons, uh, result of our regional training conference, uh, what we put on on the third day. So I'm excited to show you that here in, uh, in just a few moments. All right, some training opportunities we talk about. Uh, you know, we've offered those regional training conferences, and we had our first one based on the new format I'm going to talk to you about here uh, just last week in uh, South Bay. The South Bay Fire Department, they were fantastic hosts. They helped us out so much. Um, first of all, it was a great facility. And secondly, they had coffee ready in the morning. Uh, we brought in lunch each day, but they made sure there was coffee and pastries each morning for all the participants and uh, couldn't have asked for a better room. Um, and we had a lot of attendees there. So it was a terrific event. And in fact, one of the ideas that came out of that event has been implemented in our system already. I'm going to show you that it was it comes in the form of a report. So we offer those. I'll, I'll be showing you when those are coming up. We also offer on-site training. Uh, specifically just for your department or a cluster of departments that go in on on, uh, on that event. Uh, and then we offer, also offer online training. In fact, I'll be doing one this afternoon with the department, one of our customers in Florida. So we're calling it the Emergency Reporting Experience. And what it encompasses is a three-day regional training conference. And our day one is called Essentials, where we basically we go over the entire system, but we touch on the key points within each module, and then we cover the two most used modules uh, by nearly everyone in any organization are incidents and training. So we cover those two in depth. And then uh, on the day two, that's on day one of the essentials. 
Day two is integration where the content is driven exclusively by the students. They produce users, what we call user stories. We kind of integrate some of the software development uh, process into our training now. And with the users, we they tell us what they want to know about the system specifically. So we focus especially on their needs. And that, that went uh, very, very well on day two. Um, we were able to cover the entire day with the various user stories that, uh, that the participants at South Bay uh, wanted, uh, wanted answered and covered. So uh, very good engagement there. And then the last day is our leader or lead ER. And that covers the administration module in depth. We talk about the Google Map integration, uh, vision our vision module as well as uh, our upcoming analytics module. And uh, then we also talk about the app, uh, the occupancy app at the end of the day. But in between the beginning and the end, we uh, spend the afternoon going through what we call a mini Metascrum process where we explain how our software is developed and how complicated that process is. And this is something I've learned over the past few months and I was never aware of how, how involved this process is. And we, we just touch on it a little bit, but th then at the end of that, we have, we discuss, we debate, and then we vote on the top, what we call user stories in uh, during that event. And those top three or four get sent on to our product owner team to uh, be discussed um, in the develop um, in the development process. And it's very, uh, it's very good. And, and we had some terrific ideas. Um, some were, well, the number one idea was pretty big. Uh, we, uh, we told them it was epic and we said, you sure you want to vote for this? They said, you know, we understand it's big, but we want to get this on the radar. So that was basically the ability to do, do rig checks in the, in the maintenance module. But one of the stories wasn't so epic and was something that we could, we could accomplish in a relatively short amount of time. And I'll show you that here momentarily. I've got some questions popping up here. I want to make sure I don't need to answer anything. I don't know, Mark, go Seahawks. I don't know, bud. Mark's our, one of our, uh, support technicians. He's chiming in the Seahawks. I guess we'll see about that one. Okay. Let me make sure no one has other questions. All right. Here's the breakdown, um, the three days uh, and how we do it. That's also available to participate in just the one day, the essentials, or you can participate in the days two and three only or all three days. So you can see those options there down at the bottom, essentials only, integration and leader, or the entire three-day experience. That's day one. As I mentioned, it's uh, an, an in-depth explanation of our system, and and actually that is the that is not the right word. It's really an overview. So it's really an overview of the system, and then we really focus on training and incidents. Day two is that agile process I talked about earlier, and that what that is what drives the entire day. Um, we do wrap up some loose ends from day one if necessary. Uh, like like in South Bay, we uh, cover the calendar early on on this day, but the rest of the day was dedicated exclusively to the students' requests. Then day three. And of course, what's not on here is we also cover the uh, the app as well. Here they are. Coming up, we've got uh, one in Leland. February 22nd and 24th. So if you're near there, we need to fill some more seats uh, in the Leland event. We'd love to see you. Uh, you can give con contact Casey. She'll get you all the details and uh, we'll direct you to our Eventbrite site and uh, you can register directly online. Um, I know at South Bay, we had to, multiple multiple people, uh, the chief would register for them via the department or through, uh, through the department credit card. It just makes it, uh, makes it really easy. You can register more than one person going through the Eventbrite site, and uh, but Casey will be there to answer any questions that you have on it. Colorado in March, 25th through the 27th. Looking forward to that event as well. Hopefully it'll be a celebration after this weekend, I hope. Then back in Washington in April, in Yakima County. And then out to the East Coast in Morris County, uh, New Jersey, May 20th through the 22nd. So if, if you're close to any one of these, um, please take a look uh, at, at our Eventbrite uh, site that shows all these events as well. Or if you need to learn learn more, Casey will be able to help you with that. With that said, I want to launch one more poll, another poll here. And just we want to see those of you joining us for the first time. And I did recognize some familiar names uh, on the list today. So thank you for being a, a, a regular here with us on Virtual Thursdays. And I know you've seen this poll before, but if you could just indulge me a moment and, and vote. Uh, 
everybody wouldn't mind just uh, chiming in here. And you can pick more than one too. And one thing we do promise you, you're not going to get on any spam email list or anything like that. We're not going to pester you. But if you are interested, we'd like to make contact with you to share some more details, especially if you're interested in hosting. And thanks to Casey, she has sent out a link, if you check your chat inbox, of all the uh, current open events on the Eventbrite site. Okay, we'll close the poll in 10 seconds. Still need a few more of you to vote. Closing in 10 Five, three, two, and one. Last chance to vote. Go ahead and press that button. All right. So our results. Good. Got a lot of interest there. Um, online training as well as uh, hosting and attending a regional training conference. So thank you, everybody, for voting there. We've got some plan for the second half of 2014 in uh, these areas. I'm still working out the details, but if you're near any of these, look for uh, some more announcements, both on Eventbrite and here in Virtual Thursdays. Okay, some latest system features I wanted to show you. I'm going to toggle between this and uh, my web browser, but something in incidents um, in the EPCR, um, we, we, we run into an issue where people would put in a two-digit year, for example, 14 for 2014. Well, now we've got it. You can just put in, and it wouldn't. It would kick it back saying it needs to have a four-digit year. So now um, our developers were, went ahead and made it to where if you put in a two-digit year, say 14, the year will auto-convert to a four-digit year. So this is what you put in. This is what it automatically converts to. So again, it's one less frustrating little error message to slow you down as you're processing and going through your uh, your PCR and your incident report. So great job to our guys in development. This was in direct response to requests from our users. Okay, this came out of, this is what I had mentioned earlier. This report was one of the top four user stories that were voted on by the, by the participants in our South Bay Regional Training Conference. Um, out in day, day three, the lead ER, the leader day. And this report is current certifications by personnel for personnel for expiration date range. So what this means, um, if you've been with us, is that I know by looking just at the title of this, uh, this report is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to sort basically by personnel. And I can filter and select groups of personnel. And I can select that expiration date range. So let's go do that real quick here. I wanted to to show you this in our demo account. So shortcut, now that I know the report number and I will certainly make it one of my favorites, but I can type in the report number. And I'm gonna make it a little bit larger for everybody to see. Okay, so one neat thing with this one is I can do a uh, group of people. So I can go, I can pick multiple and then uh, add to the list and name that list. I've already created one, so I'm going to preload selection from, from our demonstration during South Bay. I'm going to click OK. And then the expiration date is here. So say I want to see everything that expires by the end of quarter one, 2014. And I better broaden it out just in case, because I don't know how many certifications we've got in the system. I'm hoping I get some numbers. If not, I'll redo the personnel. So I'm going to create a report, and this will show me who expires in 2014. Yes, I've got one. Good. So this means by personnel, so it's going to sort alphabetically by all the personnel I've selected. In this case, I only have one, Vern. When it's effective, when it expires, so then I'll have a list of everything that expires in 2014. Of course, I can take it out to you know, a month or even just a specific date if I wanted to. And a start and end date range. So if I just want a two-week period, I can do that, or a one-week period. Let me show you all personnel here. And we're going to just do it for the entire year of 2014. And there's, a, there's, and it's all pulling from expiration. It looks for the expiration date of anything in 2014 in this column here. So hats off to the development team for being able to do 
get this report created so quickly into the system and to our uh, director of support and training, uh, Bob Burton, because he does the mock-ups on these to get it out to development. So um, you can see we're just a, a week away, a little over a week from our South Bay event, and we were able to create this report at, directly as a result of the request from the regional training conference. That is unusual. Well, it's not, it's not something that we say can happen each and every time because their epic story certainly could not be taken uh, with doing truck checks um, in the maintenance puzzle. Certainly couldn't happen in a week or two weeks, uh, but it's on the radar and it has gotten the attention of our development team. But this one we can create and we want to respond as promptly as possible to those participants at the conferences. And so we were able to get this report uh, out there very quickly. So great job to everybody on the team. Very, very cool. Okay. The other thing, uh, the personnel picker, which is what I just showed you, the ability to pick multiple people and then create groups by shifts, by station, however you see fit in your department, was this that particular picker was also added to this roster information uh, per personnel for date range for personnel list as well. And you're going to see as we move forward, a lot of our reports, and certainly new reports, you're going to see these uh, when, when personnel are involved. Uh, especially you're going to see the picker list, um, the personnel picker. You're also going to be able to see the ability to sort by. So if you've been exporting to Excel because you wanted to sort by a different column, we're bringing that into a lot of our reports, especially the top 20 reports. But as more reports are being developed, that ability to sort by, if you get your results to sort by, like say the parameters are personnel, alphabetical, uh, date range, uh, station, you can sort by all the various uh, parameters um, on that particular report before the report gets generated and it'll be in one of the, the drop downs here. So you'll start seeing those appear in many more reports um, as we move forward. Okay, this one I definitely want to demonstrate because this was just told to me today. Uh, it just got implemented into the system. This has been a frequent request by a lot of supervisors and chiefs um, out there that want to be able to let people know when they have an incomplete incident that needs to be completed. So it's not just an internal in-system notification um, with your, uh, your, your welcome on your welcome page. It will send, if you choose to do this, you can send an email outside of the system to remind um, a crew member or somebody that they have a, an incomplete report that needs to be completed. This is what it looks like on the page, but I'm going to actually demonstrate it here so you can see. And this is brand new. I just learned this today. It was just, it's just been implemented into the system probably not more than 24, 48 hours ago. So you guys are getting the first shot at it. Go back out. All right. So I'm in an incident and I'm a supervisor. And I've got... This report. I've got this report assigned to me. Okay, actually, I'm going to do the, yeah, we can do this one. And it is not yet complete. I'm going to reassign it just so I can demonstrate this email to, to Dave. And that happened on my second screen, but basically, what I did, I want to show it to you so you guys can see it exactly. I reassigned the call to Dave. I simply selected him, clicked reassign. Okay. And I'm going to uh, authorize, I'm going to complete it. Say he's completed the report. So let's pretend, oops, let's pretend I'm Dave right now and I'm completing the report. But I go in as a supervisor and I looked at something, I was like, you know, we've got to update some information about the fire service casualties. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click make incomplete. You'll follow me over here to the hyperlink, the orange text. Remember, everything that you see that's orange text in ER, is, it, it takes you somewhere. It's a hyperlink. So in this case, it's that contact submitter uh, where I can send them an email. And it's Dave. And I just put in Dave at work. Now, I was playing with this earlier. And the email that auto-populates here is the email that you've set up in the personnel list. But if that's not the one you want to send it to, you can change it. So, so it doesn't go to Dave. I'm going to send it just to me. And it will send it in the subject line that this incident number has been marked incomplete. You can put notes in here as to why. Please update.
and then you don't even if you make it incomplete if you choose you don't want to do this you can click cancel no problem but I actually want to send this notification and it's now incomplete it allows that person to go back and make changes and we'll give it a few minutes and I'll show you what that email looks like uh, when it comes to the person so to the person that you're sending it to so that is brand new it's been requested by many and is now in the system so any questions on that I see a question has popped up I want to take a quick peek here okay nope we're good all right outstanding I'll toggle back over to the PowerPoint I'll wait for that email to come in usually takes a few minutes All right, no questions on that. Moving along. Okay, always, where to find the latest information? Keep in mind that you're gonna see the system notifications at the very top of the welcome page. So essentially, at the home page, you've got all of this up here. System updates, virtual training, but keep in mind those go away after two weeks. They automatically, once they're posted, it's a two week, um, they pop off if you don't read them. Now they pop off the screen if you don't read them. Of course, you can clear them by clicking the red X over here. But if, they're, if it looks, if your screen looks like this and you want to say, ah, what was that update again? Remember, go to support, click on any item in the updates and news. It will take you to all of them, and then you can review them again from there. So that's the best way to see what's going on in the system. And you can see it goes back. I think it, there's a, it, it's six, looks like it's about six months worth of postings, virtual Thursdays, the uh, any kind of updates, uh, upgrades, uh, events like join the coach or community video contest, different things will appear here. So uh, just because if you, I know some of our customers, especially our volunteer departments, they may not log in, but every two weeks or so, so they may miss some of this. So spread the word that this is the great, this is another great way to keep up on what's going on with emergency reporting. And I just got a chime for that email. So let me show you what that email looks like. It's real simple. It's going to be a no reply at emergencyreporting.com. And it says an incident you submitted for review has been marked incomplete. Please update the fire casualty info. Thanks. So they'll get it in their email. So not only will they have the system notification when they log into the system, in the event that they're still on shift or want to be able to get, uh, get that squared away, uh, while they're out, you know, get back from a drill or they come back from their day off, they'll know they'll be in their, in their email inbox. So uh, great job for the development team for getting that uh, deployed. Questions on that? So again, I just wanted you to see what it looked like. Okay, that's our support button um, for updates and news. So that's the best place to find all that. Of course, we've got user voice. And this particular one, I just did a screen grab. This was from the South Bay. Um, Chief Dixon out there, there was a lot of requests to have a drag and drop function for scheduling in the roster to be able to drag and drop and move people around quickly by dragging and dropping. So everybody in the classroom, we had a little hiccup that Amber, uh, Amber, our, our finance person, fixed for us in the system, in the user voice system. We hit it so many times and so fast, the user voice system thought it was spam, but we were able to fix it. And she got 57 votes just in one sitting. So then she goes and talks to her department. The other departments talk to their people. And all of a sudden, you've got a lot of votes now for a great idea. So that's the key, getting those votes. So remember, user voice is your voice um, in the system. And it allows you to have a say in what gets developed. And remember, the top votes are the, the ones that catch the eyes of the product owners and the development team. So take the time to vote. If you log in, you get a total of 100 votes. You can vote up to... Uh, uh, give three votes for any single category until you exhaust your 100 votes. And then as an idea is either one implemented or um, flat out declined because it's not something we can do or is able, are able to do, then you know, those votes will be restored to your account. So 100 votes can go a long way in, in picking some good ideas. And imagine you've got a 20, 30 member department. There's for a single idea, you've got 900 votes, right? Or I'm sorry, you've got 90 votes right there for a single idea. So um, please take time to go to that. It's feedback.emergencyreporting.com. Okay, we're welcome our newest customers. This was all since last week, and I'd like to thank Adrian Mintz, the, uh, the 
the founder and chief operating officer of our of our team of our family and emergency reporting for uh, taking over and uh, taking the helm last week and going over Enfor's exports. That that particular virtual Thursday should be posted by Monday, so um, you can view it after the fact uh, through our knowledge base on the user voice site. Okay, Porch Creek in Alabama, Stafford Fire and Rescue in New Hampshire, North Braddock Volunteer Fire Department in Pennsylvania, and the Westwood Fire Company also in Pennsylvania. We've got the Warren Volunteer Fire Department in North Carolina, Blaine Hill in Pennsylvania, Paradise, sounds like a nice department, Paradise Volunteer Fire Department in Texas, and Hiwa Sea Dam in North Carolina. Uh, that's a, this would be an interesting one. Chicago Rockford International Airport in Illinois, uh, Fort Benning Fire and Emergency Services in Georgia, Green Rock Volunteer uh, Fire Department in Pennsylvania, Highlands Fire and Rescue in North Carolina. Welcome aboard to all those departments. Last page, these two just came in today. Uh, London Fire Department in Ohio upgraded to a full system uh, in Ohio and Fort Jackson Fire and Emergency Services in South Carolina. So welcome everybody to the ER family. I hope some of you are joining us today. Uh, if you know any of these departments or you're nearby, please spread the word about the different features and training options as well as the virtual Thursdays to get them uh, up to speed as fast as possible with our system. We are gonna be introducing a, a new customer orientation program that's a little different than what we've been doing. Um, that's gonna launch in February. So we'll have more for, more for all of you on that uh, in a future virtual Thursday. All right, this is what we all came here for today. Agency friends, what exactly is it? We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna also see what data can actually be shared between agencies. We're gonna learn how to set up agency friends and learn where, where that shared data appears in the, the, the department you're sharing it with, the receiving department. We're also gonna look at some of the reports briefly um, that are related to agency friends. And the one thing I want, I want to leave and start and end with is that your data is safe and secure. Anything that you share this way with another department is all read only, which means that they can see it and, and, and only see some parts of it. And I'll show you which parts those are. Um, they cannot alter anything in your account. You're basically granting them permission to see some of the things within your account. And I'll show you when we do the um, automatic aid, mutual aid, how that all works too. But um, if there's any concern or fear out there that your data could get compromised or they're going to have access to your system, that's definitely not the case whatsoever. Now, another alternative that um, we've talked about, I know Mark, is, uh, our support tech has mentioned this, and it's a great idea that if, if they need, if you're a neighboring department or say, the building department in your in your in your organization or in your municipality, the water department, they need a little more access than what agency friends give. You can give them a login to your account because with emergency reporting, you're not it's by station, um, it's not by person. You have unlimited users, um, so you can add, say, the director of water uh, and share and show them all your hydrant data by giving them a login with restricted access only to the hydrant module. So many of you, all those buttons that appear on the left side of your screen when you log in, if you give them limited access, they're only gonna see, say, hydrants. That'll be the only button that appears to them and you can, can control what they see and do. That's an alternative to the agency friends um, in the event that you need to show them more different information than it's available through, through the agency friending. All right, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Um, it's always good to have you on board. We've got a, a good number of people participating with us and we're gonna get started. I'm gonna show you in the system how that works, but I do have to launch one more poll because I'm curious to see how many of you are actually using Agency Friends. So if you wouldn't mind voting, take a few seconds. And I'm really curious to see how many are actually taking advantage of it because it's not, as you probably discovered that those of you that are using it, it's not the easiest to understand or set up. So I'm hoping to alleviate any concern today and, and uh, confusion about it. Okay, we'll close it in 10 seconds. 10. Five. Okay, last chance to vote. Are you using agency friends? Closing poll now. Okay, so about two thirds of you are not and one third of you are. Okay, very good. So those of you that are, if you have any tips of how you've used it, um, please send a chat message and I'll probably open up your mic and you can share some of your experience as we go through it. And those are the two thirds of you that have not, hopefully you'll, you'll find some value in it today.
Okay, first and foremost, we got to start at the admin settings. So if you have administrative privileges, you'll go to the administration module. And over on the right column, you're going to see agencies that can access our data. You'll click on that. Make this a little bigger. There we go. Oops, excuse me. All right. So here, right now, I've already added. I've already added this agency. But if I wanted to add a new agency, I would simply cl click here, type in the name, and their FDID or their EMS ID. Either or. Even though they're both red, this is one of the rare instances in our system where, despite them both being red, it only needs one or the other. And you have to be in the same, currently our system is firewalled by state, so you have to be in the same state. You don't have to be adjacent to each other, um, your jurisdictions don't have to abut each other, but you do have to be in the same state to be able to use it. So here, breaking it down, these are what you can and cannot see. I have found that the two most powerful and most interesting of them are the incidents and the occupancy. These come into reports, and I'll show you that um, as we go through this. But the two that I found to be most useful are, are in the incidents and occupancy. What this allows you to do in incidents is it allows for the mutual automatic aid links to appear between the departments. So if you give aid, you can pull up the, pull up the incident from the other department that you gave aid to, and it select that for the incident that you gave aid to. It's going to be much, make much better sense when I show it to you. And I'm going to toggle between the department giving aid and the department receiving aid so you can see the differences in how it appears. So it's one of those things that I can talk about, but I'll probably just confuse you. you got to see it, and I will do that. Uh, and you can see the main purpose of the link is to show all apparatus on the scene and not just be limited to those that went that were sent from the host agency. The other powerful uh, part of this is in forms, and this is particularly useful, especially in the prevention departments, fire marshals, and inspectors, because if you got a department within your state, and I think, of course, if they're neighboring you, great, but if they're within your state, you've gone to a regional training conference, you've talked to them, say, so, you know, I'd like, that is a great form that you use for your hood system inspection, or that's a great form you use for uh, nursing homes and assisted livings. Can I use that? Can I see that? And instead of you having to manually recreate it, you could be a friend, agency friend them, click on the read only here, and again, it's all read-only. You'll notice it's either none or read-only. You can click on that. And then when you go to create a new form in your department, I'm going to show you this, their list of forms will drop down and allow you to use that form, one of their forms, as a template for your form. You can't use and directly use their form. It's just they're permitting you to use it as a template so you don't have to Re reinvent the wheel or rewrite your entire form based on theirs. It is a humongous time saver and a really good way for uh, prevention departments to share best practices. The others are for, for reports, and I'll pull up a list of reports that, uh, that encompass uh, this part of agency friends. But like I said, the two biggest ones are in incidents and occupancy, and that's what I want to spend um, our time, time with primarily today. Any questions so far? I'm going to go back to the list. So right now, CalTest 2, which is the department that's receiving aid in this particular instance, has all of these as read-only, so we're good to go. And also know that you can remove access at any time. All right. We hope, you know, we certainly hope the relationship stays, stays solid among the departments. Uh, and you won't ever have to do this, but it does, there is the option to completely remove all access. All right. Let's talk about incidents first. So in this case, I've got a motor vehicle collision um, in South Pasadena, California here, but the key I'm, for this, for demonstration purposes, it's the address I want you to look at. So I've got 501 West College Way, Northwest, number 123. So in my report, in basic info one, which I'll load here, and everybody just type a chat message. I know sometimes I get talking fast, and there's a slight lag as I move page to page. So if I start talking about the page that hasn't quite let, uh, loaded on your screen, tell me to slow down. It's no problem because um, I have my iPad up too as a, kind of as a client so I can see the, the delay and make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. But just you won't hurt my feelings if you have to send a chat message. Say, Tom, slow down. It's no problem. Okay, basic info one. I've chosen in this particular case that I'm going to give mutual aid. 
That's all you need to do here as I've given mutual aid. And you can do this whether or not you're have a, you're friending an agency or not. Uh, it's, this is not this having friended an agency or data shared with an agency um, gives you a unique option on the basic info five, which I'll show you here in a minute. You would put in your run, put in all your information as as you would for the incident, times, uh, units that responded. Then on basic info five. You'll see that there is a box below the actions taken box. Again, this is basic info five. Fill in all the required fields for ENFERS. Then you can look up to see if there is a department that had that you responded to during that time frame and pull their information without having to manually type it. So I'm going to pull up another window will pop up. I'm going to bring that over from my other screen. And sure enough, yep. That's it. Oh, same address. I had to put a different city because it's a different account. But essentially, yep, that's that their incident information. All this does by clicking the 2014-1 link here is autofill their FDID, the state, and their incident number. So if that's the incident, and there could be multiples, multiple ones listed if there's multiple mutual aid incidents that have gone out at the same time period. So if it is, I'm going to click that. And you can see it auto filled all of that information for me right here. Just a second, there's one thing I do want to confirm before I tell you the wrong thing. Yes, the incident itself has to be completed uh, before this will pop up, and it is. It doesn't have to be reviewed, but it does have to be completed, I noticed. So, basic info five is filled. You'll see it'll turn green up at the top here. And now I'm ready to authorize this report. We're good to go. So that's the agency that gave aid. What about the agency that received aid? What does that look like? Let me bring this over so you can all see it. Give me a second to make it larger. Okay. So this is the agency receiving aid. What does it look like in their account? Well, they have to, they have to select on basic info one that they received aid down here at the bottom. So the mutual aid was received. And then in their basic, uh, basic info four, not five, four, it will show, and this other one was from a previous incident, so disregard it. The one below is the one I just entered from my call that I just completed. Um, we were practicing and it kept it from another uh, another incident that we had created. So basically, I, I the, the giving department, their apparatus will appear here, but you can see there's nothing that can be edited whatsoever. It's simply taking, it knows the fact that it was given and received by this department and the unit that provided the aid will appear on basic info for here as an uneditable unit on the scene. So it allows the receiving department to see exactly who responded, um, again, mutual aid and or automatic aid and that they're agency friends. And then now this incident is ready to complete. And you can see, let me move on back here. It's the FDID of the, of the agency, the unit, the alarm, and all their time, the alarm time and all the rest of the incident times that were entered. So let me take a quick pause here, look for see if we got any questions. I know Sarah's probably been answering them all as they've come in, but I do want to see if there's any other that have come in. Tim's asked a question about, and Sarah's answered it, great. Friends features only, only read only, yep. And only admins can set it up. Thank you, Sarah. That's exactly right. This is very restrictive, and it's meant to be restrictive because whoever sets it up should have administrator privileges and can only have administrator privileges to set it up. And two, any of the data that is that is shared is unalterable by the receiving department. Let's see, Tim, that's got answered. Okay, so Tim has another question. So to be clear, if I give access to another department, their admins will determine who has access to the info. Okay, that's a good question, Tim. What it does is over here. So there, so we're talking about the receiving department. So in this case, 
you, say you as the giving department gives them read-only access to all five of those categories. In the administration module, when I We, uh, you've given them only certain access. So you are the Cal test department. You've given Cal test two, this one access here. It lets me know what you've given me access to, but keep in mind, it's only in these modules and reports. So for example, admin, it's not so much that admins only have access to the information. It's how the information is used. So if you have occupancy, if you have permission, to use the occupancy module and there are different levels there but if you have the ability to go in and create forms in the occupancy module then you will be able to see the giving departments list of forms that you can now create a template or a form from you won't see their you won't be able to edit their forms in any way shape or form nor can anyone edit your forms um, if you share your forms but remember they have to have permission to use the occupancy module to even see that in the first place the rules still apply uh, for each module, whether or not you have access, full access, limited access, read-only access based on the module. Same with incidents. You can you do automatic aid and the person completing the report will have that ability to select the incident that goes with the one they gave aid to, but that's it. That's all they'll be able to do. Um, and that's only on their incident. And again, there's various levels within the incidents module too. There's no access, there is submitter, there is supervisor, and there's administrator most of the crews will have super, uh, submitter only. So in that case, they're gonna have limited access to anybody else's um, incident, especially the HIPAA protected data. Uh, and then they won't be able to edit anyone else's incidents if you give them limited access. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that answers your question, Tim. And yep, you posted it does. Good, good. I'll try and make that as clear as mud or at least clearer than mud. Good, I'm glad I was able to answer that. All right. So that's the incident example. We'll go back briefly. Does anyone have any questions specifically when it comes to incidents? Okay, seeing none, we'll move forward here. The next one I wanna show you, that I, again, that's the other one I think is a very powerful uh, sharing tool is in the occupancy module. So as I mentioned before, one, you've got to have, you've got to have permissions uh, for the occupancy module and you'll go to settings, you, and you'll go to inspection forms. As an aside, let me show you this briefly so you can see exactly what I mean by permissions. And I know the admins out there, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, but if you don't have administrative privileges, I wanna show you this so you can see the table. And this is, this is one of those things I recommend, especially administrators, to bookmark this particular page because it is extremely useful, especially when you're setting up personal access settings, module, I'm sorry, module access permissions. So on this page, a little zoom. So now we're talking about the occupancy module. So I'm gonna scroll down to the occupancy settings right in here. I'm gonna highlight it so it's easy to see. So if I have only read only, I can view occupancies, but I can't get into the settings at all, at all. If I have limited access, I can access settings or inspection form information. Oops, I'm sorry, this is what I can do. I can add new occupancy categories and subcategories and modify information within occupancies. Left column, can do. Right column, can't do. Okay, so in read only, I can view. Can't do anything else, can't access settings. So in Tim's case, you would have to have full access to the occupancy module to be able to get into the forms. So that's what I wanted to show you in these various settings. And the occupancy module is one of our modules that you have four different possibilities. Strongly recommend bookmark this page, especially admins out there. Like, I wonder what settings I need to give this person and you know what responsibilities do they have in the organization? Oh yeah, he needs he needs full access because he's out there doing inspections and up, he's in charge of our pre-planned program. So it'll help you with that. Okay, back in here. So here I go into settings, backtrack just so follow me through. We go to settings. We go to inspection forms and I'm going to add a new form. I've decided, I'm glad we're, we're, we sh we're friends now with Caltest too, and they have this great form I want to use. So I'm going to name the form great new form 
and we're going to start from these are all my forms here basic agency friend demo that was what I'm sharing and then you've got inspection that's my forms now then you've got a little grayed out section here that says Cal test and that's the that's the one of their forms. They only have one form in their system right now, but it's basic day inspection. So I like it. I'm going to use it. So I'm going to use that as my template. I'm going to click save. It's going to take me back out to my inspection forms list. And I'm going to now edit that form. The pencil and paper icons are edit icon, as you guys know. And now this is their form, but now I can edit it inside my account only in this form called great new form. So this was their awesome form. Now I'm going to go in. I need to make a few adjustments because we've got some different things in our jurisdiction that we've got to, we've got to add to it. Or they have this and they have this big uh, microchip fabrication plant. I don't need that. So I'm going to go ahead and remove those. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and remove those categories or questions. So that's how that's done. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on that? Like I said, I think it's a great way to share each other's work without having to duplicate effort and you build relationships, um, interdepartmental relationships really well. Let me make sure I'm not missing any questions. Just a second. Nope, no questions here. Okay. All right. So that is We've covered incidents. We've covered the occupants. Work comes over in occupancies. Now I do have one. We're going to show you. I'm going to show you those reports. But before I forget, I have one last poll, and I'm curious to see what other information from your perspective, you know, in your department that you'd like to see as something that can be shared um, across departments through our platform here. I'm gonna, I've got these, and if you have another, just type it in in the chat message. So go ahead and. Uh, Take a look. What other depart? What other data would you like to be able to share with friend with the friend department? You know, and if it's something other, just click other and then type it in in the chat. These were ones I thought were kind of events, occupancies, task sheets, and training classes. I figured were ones that'd be fairly common. And of course, we'd have to figure out what part of the training class would be shared. But certainly maybe the templates um, is one idea, uh, even the ability to share, you know, your training codes. But I'd be curious to see what you guys like. Let's give it a few more minutes, a few more seconds. We'll close it in 10. About a little more than half of you have voted. So let's chime in if you've got, a, got an opinion here. We're really, I'm, I'm personally curious and I think our development team would be curious too if we were to expand the agency friends uh, component of our system. Okay, closing in 10, 9, 8. Five. Okay, last chance to vote. Two and one. Closing poll. Okay, overwhelmingly, we've got uh, task sheets, JPRs, but training classes. So it looks like a lot when it comes to training would be something you'd find valuable here. Okay, very good. Let me put, let's see. No one checked the other, but let me make sure no one has put in anything. Nope. No other thoughts there. Okay. Cool. Very good. Okay, well, thank you, guys. This is very, as, as all the polls are there, these are very, very helpful. Okay, lastly, I want to cover the reports where things appear in reports. So here, the keyword is interagency, I believe. Let me make sure. No, it's not. Uh, inter. There it is. Okay, so what this does not all one word, it's a single word. Let me type in inter-agency and see what I can get. Pair that list down. Okay, so what you're what you're able to do is this is the interagency. Um, it's pooling if you've if you've checked those various um, components in agency friends, then go back and show you that. If you've checked apparatus, it'll populate on these reports. If you've selected that, um, hydrants and then personnel will populate on these various reports. So let me go back. So you can see how many 
in this case, incident count for fire calls for interagency for date range. You can see an average response time for interagency for response mode for date range. So let's take a look at that one, and it probably won't give us much here, but like we went lights and sirens, and the date range Try and pull up today's call that we just demoed. Let's see if it'll give it to me. And it did. Okay, so the agency we responded to, because remember, I'm in CalTest 2 here. So CalTest, we went lights and sirens, and it took eight minutes to get on scene in this interagency response. So that, and again, I just have the one call, but again, if you're running mutual aid or automatic aid frequently, this particular report could help you as far as average response time. But, and again, that's just one. Let's go back out to interagency. Call volume. How many calls? You How many calls? And when you see count, it's just going to give you uh, a number of how many calls. And... I like this. We'll go 2014, and this should be zero because that particular call was an EMS call. But let's take it. Let's confirm it. And it yep, didn't like it probably because there's no data to find, which is fine. Let's try this one. Got an error message on that one, so we'll have to find another report that will be what we're looking for. Back to in. that one should give us one. So how and this say you run, say you run with multiple departments, mutual aid and automatic aid. I know like the Phoenix metro area, they have a seamless um, automatic response. This would be a particularly interesting report to pull uh, for for uh, the Phoenix metro area. But it will show you by per month. The per means it's going to show, uh, sort by per, uh, by the month. Um, show you each month, so you can see that call we just ran. Let me make that larger. Okay, made the P, didn't make the PDF larger, which is okay. So we've got Caltest. That's the department. A one interagency incident that was received by Caltest. So you'll notice down at the bottom, and this is a key thing to know about all the reports, or nearly every one of our reports will tell you the criteria that was used in creating that report. So only reviewed incidents, and this is also known as incidents by FDID crosstab. And then at multiple agencies, I think that, yeah, that's what I just did. Okay, no, per agency, my bad. Same with the year. So again, I only have one agency, but it would give me a bar graph if I had multiple agencies um, by the number of number of mutual aid incidents that I have uh, responded to. Okay. So those are the reports. So if you're if you have this already activated in your system, the agency friends or plan on doing it, I strongly recommend that you in, in the reports go to interagency, and you'll be able to have call volume, fire, geospatial, and response times in the incidents. Now, part of it also was in the occupancy. So let me go and type in. Anything with occupancy? Do, do, do. Let's type in for better search. So these are all the ones that relate to the interagency, which are done in the agency friends. So we've got interagency hydrants and fire losses. That's come through incidents. Turnout time, and then the personnel when you check personnel. 
So personnel from agencies shown are those which have selected to share their personnel data with your agency. But remember, the data is being shared only in this format here through the, uh, through the reports module. So, all right, let me take a look at any questions. So we've covered uh, how, it, how it affects automatic and mutual aid and incidents, both the giving and the receiving department. We went ahead and looked at how forms come on over to make your lives easier when you're creating forms that you like from another department or that one that likes your, your form that you'd like to share. And then the various reports for the other three categories. And the keys, the keyword search here is interagency, interagency with a dash. That's the search. Um, and that will pull up all, all the ones that come from agency friends. All right, I'm going to go over to the questions. Any questions? No, no questions so far. We've got a couple more minutes before we wrap up. Well, thank you guys uh, for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Um, great participation, um, Tim and uh, David. Thanks for uh, participating with the questions. We'll stay on for a few more minutes. Let me toggle out of this. All right, so if you need to learn more or um, have suggestions for any vir other virtual Thursday topics, um, send that over to Casey at emergencyreporting.com. You can also send it to training at emergencyreporting.com. But Casey's, she takes care of this and she's on top of it quickly. She'll respond to you. I, I don't think there's a time where she hasn't responded same day to people that have, that have uh, emailed her. So um, let us know some feedback if you're interested in, in uh hosting or participating in an event. We'd love to hear from you. And Casey will probably be making a quick call or email to you if you, uh, when you based on uh, what you were uh, responded to in our first poll earlier, our first polls earlier in, in the session today. So, all right, everybody stay safe. Um, if you're in a cold area, please stay warm. Be careful on the icy roadways. Um, we'll have a, hopefully we'll uh, have a good Super Bowl this weekend. Go Broncos. And, uh, well, I'll stay on for a few more minutes in case any other questions pop on. But uh, other than that, I wish you guys a good weekend. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you again. Uh, we'll see you again next Thursday, and you'll start noticing the topics becoming more task and process specific over the next few months. Things I do want you to look for that are upcoming. Uh, we're planning on April to um, do two, at least two sessions, possibly three, on training 3.0. We're also going to be rolling out our analytics module, so we'll be doing training on that. And hopefully we'll have a couple other surprises for you in the months ahead. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for being a part of the emergency reporting family. And uh, we'll see you again next week.